gap between the active research that scientists do and the canned science that students often see in their classrooms. And we know that this gap between the classroom and research makes it hard to design authentic curriculum or to foster student identities as doers of science in communities of practice. Jean decided to do something about that gap in a spectacular way. As a high school teacher in the Fresno School District, Jean had always tried to inspire her students to consider going into science. At about 13 years ago, she joined a research program in polar science and ended up living in Antarctica for several months, involved with the research being done there and communicating with her students electronically about the whole experience. And by her students, I mean not just the students in her classroom, but students around the country who were able to see and communicate with a teacher who was immersed in a pretty dramatic kind of research. Since then, Jean has returned to the Antarctic every year with a particular focus on studying the penguins, letting students here both follow the stories of individual penguins and letting them watch scientists piece together the story of the population as a whole. Jean noticed that this communication was beneficial not just for her students, but for the scientists as well. And since then, her work, her work has expanded to encouraging others to get in on the fun by fostering partnerships between classrooms and scientists everywhere. These partnerships are a new and powerful resource for educators of all stripes. Her awards and honors include the Sierra Club Environmental Educator of the Year, the NSF Teachers Experiencing Antarctica Award, and the Einstein Fellowship at the National Science Foundation, among many others. Today she will talk with us about teacher-scientist partnerships bridging the gap between research and the K-12 classroom. So, um, as the movie goes along, I'm just going to tell you that was a very nice introduction. I, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> anyway, I, I understand I'm talking to mostly uh, teachers or pre-service teachers. Is that correct? Or people who want to go into teaching? Hopefully. And how many of you going into teaching are going to be science teachers? Yay! Okay, we need a lot of you. So, I am at the other end of my career. I have retired from the classroom after putting in 25 years in front of high school students teaching every science that there is. And at this end of my career, I have taken on what's called education and public outreach work. And I selected to do that work with scientists who are doing field work. When you get into the classroom, or maybe you remember when you were in the classroom, that science might have been like ho-hum, a lot of vocabulary, maybe some interesting little labs that you got your hands dirty, but no real authentic inquiry stuff that was going on right now. And what I try to do is connect kids to real life science going on right now. So um, I'm first going to just give you a little tour of Antarctica. I'll go to the next thing here. Let's see, this is supposed to work, I'm sure. Well, not in this technology of the world. I don't have to stand here. Maybe I can stand over here. I'll figure that better. All right, so the main point of my talk, the takeaway stuff, is that I want you to think about, as you become educators, pairing up with a scientist, a scientist who's doing real research, and get that researcher to come into your classroom. If they can't come into your classroom, use the data, use the story that that researcher has to engage your kids in science. It's as you become teachers, you already know this because you're studying education, it's all about engagement. If you don't engage those kids in what you are teaching them, you're not going to teach them anything. They're sitting there picking their noses or carving up the desks or whatever they're doing. If you do not engage them, you will not educate them. So this is all about engagement. Well, I always show this picture at the beginning of all of my presentations, and I know everybody in here knows the answer to this question of what's wrong with this picture. But remember that most of the time I talk to young children. So what do you think, I know, is anybody in here already teaching lower grades or anything? Nobody's already teaching? So what do you think kids say when I show this picture? Number one response, what do you think? Anybody? I know you guys know, but what's, what do the kids say? Number one response, penguins don't carry purses. <laughs> so what that means to me is I have a big job ahead of me. Obviously what I'm trying to get kids to realize here is that penguins and polar bears do not coexist. So there's no way that this picture could be taken. 
But most of the kids I talk to, most of the adults I talk to, mm -hmm. a lot of the teachers I talk to, all believe that penguins and polar bears coexist. So that's what I try to do, and that's why this kind of education outreach is very important. So here's Antarctica. I'm going to start out with just a little travel log. All of you know it's at the bottom of the earth. You know, it's all relative, of course, but we do call this the southern hemisphere. This is a very large continent. I've been to many classrooms where the map on the wall does not even include Antarctica. Sometimes it's a little white line down at the bottom. Sometimes it's not there at all. So students in our world do not have a sense of Antarctica, where it is, how big it is, or that it's covered with ice. Another question I ask my students, I know you guys are going to know the answers, but when I ask the students, I go, okay, why is it white? You know, they all know that. They say, well, because it's got ice on it. And I say, tell me how much ice. How deep is the ice? And they'll go, 10 feet. And I'll go, no, think big. Think big. And they'll go, 20 feet. And so it takes a long time for me to use my good Socratic skills to get the kids to think really, really big. And finally, they come up with something around two miles, which is about what the, level, what the depth of the ice is around Antarctica. So think of a continent. Oops, that's not supposed to be there. Think of a continent that's larger than the size of the United States and Mexico combined, covered with two miles of ice. So that's a lot of ice. And so when they talk about the climate, you know, global uh, uh, climate change and the polar caps melting and the sea level rising, this is where it's going to come from. So not right now, it's coming from Greenland, but it's going to eventually come from here and that sea level will rise. The ice that's not on the continent is in the ocean. This is the single largest seasonal event in our world, is the change in sea ice in Antarctica. February, remember, Southern Hemisphere, seasons reverse. So right now, we're going right into winter. They're just starting winter right now. So February, right, you know, the end of summer. So this shows you the fight there is how much sea ice is out there. Now, think in your head, I think you've already got to see the slide, but think in your head, okay, August would be the height of the winter. So how much do you think the sea ice is going to increase? Think in your head, get a mental picture. Here it is. It doubles the size of Antarctica. So this is a very large event, and it's also very important. It's important for the penguins, and it's important for a lot of the animals. A lot of the food sources are underneath this ice. This is a large part of what cools or keeps our... Our planet cool, it reflects sunlight back into outer space, so if this thing goes away, then this will uh, increase the global climate change that's occurring. It's very important for the penguins. When you fly over Antarctica, 30,000 feet, this is what you look like. This is why the continent's all white, because guess what? It is. There is nothing on this continent except a lot of snow. Even the mountains are covered with snow. There is nothing there. People think that it's all static, and in fact it's not. A lot of the ice are in ice streams. Very dynamic. People are studying these right now, primarily due to the climate change that's occurring. These streams are starting to speed up in their movement. They used to go really, really slow now. that Some of them are moving several meters a week, so it's very dynamic. And they're beautiful. <laughs> from 30,000 feet, they're even more beautiful if you get to stand on them. But right now I'm looking at them from a plane. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous continent. Again, this is a very large continent. It's not that little tiny line at the bottom of the map. This picture shows you some of the um, continent of Antarctica, which is this white stuff. Remember, it's all covered with glaciers. Those glaciers are, are two miles deep, and as they are very, very heavy, they start to whoosh out to gravity as they move away from the South Pole in all directions. And when they come to the ocean, they are connected still. They start to float out over the ocean, and they become an ice shelf. So this is actually the land glacier, which is moving off of the land and does not break off, but moves on to the ocean. So actually, you can swim underneath. Any of these green things on the map are shelves where those glaciers have moved off. And when pieces of those ice shelves break off, they're called Starts with I, rhymes with iceberg. <laughs> great, great iceberg. When these things break off, they're called icebergs. That's when icebergs are formed in the off of Greenland. They cause problems with the shipping lanes up there, so they monitor them very closely there. Down here, there's no ships, so we don't worry about them so much down here. But we are monitoring them because more and more of them are breaking off, 
and larger ones. Anyway, this one down here, Ross Ice Shelf, is the one where I work. I work right on this island here. This is as large as Grant. So it's a very large piece of ice. Here's a cutaway of Antarctica showing you those two miles. And then how the, oops, I don't know how to do this, remember? Um, how the uh, ice shelf then now floats off the ocean here. Those ice shelves, I'll tell you a story about them in a second, but very, very interesting and a source of lots of studying right now. Anyway, this is what those ice shelves look like. Question for the kids, I know you guys know the answer. I always ask the kids, is this ice fresh water or salt water? Where did it come from? The kids will all tell me it's salt water, but of course it's fresh water. It comes from snow that snowed and then snowed and then snowed some more and some more over millions of years, millions of years. These things, it's like tree rings. You can see as you cut away in them, you can see the rings of every year is laid down. And this is where they're getting that information about how our climate used to be several hundred thousand years ago. That's what it looks like if you're in a helicopter, just to give you a size. If you put an ice cube in a thing of water, how much of the ice cube is above the water? One tenth. Ten, ten percent, it's about. So look at this. Now think this is floating. So think of how much water is underneath there. You guys all saw the Titanic, so you know <laughs> what's underneath here is much more uh, dangerous and larger than what's on top. This is what the ice shelf looks like. The other kind of sea ice, not the ice shelf sea ice, is the sea ice stuff. Now this is salt water. This is that growth and decline every year with the ocean that freezes and thaws every year. So this is only about four to six feet thick, maybe 10, but in the four to six feet thick, yes, you can go out and stand on it, but you have to be very careful, and you don't want to stand near the cracks, but you can stand this. In fact, we land planes on this. This is where the penguins live. So the penguins, these penguins, uh, two species of penguins that live in Antarctica, the Adelis, the little guys, these guys here, and the emperors, some are some penguins, yeah. Oh, come on, I'm quite sorry. <laughs> Those are the emperors. They come up to your waist. They're very large birds, and they must have ice, and that's why you don't see them in zoos very often. They're very difficult to keep. So these animals must have this ice. You will never see them in any habitat. It is not ice covered. This is how we get there. We're just cargo, a big plane. We fly Los Angeles, Christchurch, New Zealand on a commercial jet, and we get in this uh, cargo. What you see here is a helicopter, so we're just... Uh, Surrounding the helicopter, we're just strapped in and we're just cargo. And here we are landing on that frozen sea ice. So there is somebody's job down there who does nothing but test this ice every day. This would be a good idea to make sure that this plane can land on it. <laughs> so we do so here we are coming out. And where I land is right there on Ross Island. If you are a tourist and go to Antarctica, most of the tourist boats, and excuse me, all of the tourist boats. Virtually all the tourist boats are up here. So your orientation, your South America, uh, Africa's over here, Australia's down here, New Zealand's right here. And in any event, this is where all the tourist activity occurs, and this is where we are here, totally other side of the continent. I'm actually on an island, and this is where I say, oh, I'm on a volcanic island, just like Hawaii, and in fact it is. <laughs> so here, this is a three volcanoes, uh, Mount Bird, Mount Erebus, and Mount Terror here. And it is all volcanic rock. It is a volcanic island, just like Hawaii, except that's where the uh, parallels stop. Here's the continent of Antarctica here. And this is that ice shelf. So here's that permanent ice. And here's the sea ice that opens and closes every year. And so that's why we get the penguins right here. The McMurdo Research Station, the largest US station. The US has three research stations here. The largest one is right here, and this is where we land and my penguins are right here. I have a colony of 5,000, there's a colony of 30,000 right here, and a colony of 500,000 over here. So my team is dispersed among those three colonies, and we study, we monitor those um, penguin colonies. This is an active volcano, go figure, who knew? Who knew there'd be an active volcano on, on, uh, in Antarctica, but there is. So here's the research station, McMurdo. Notice there are, oh, here's my question to the kids. So, what are you missing here? And the kids go, people. And I go, oh, okay, I didn't get any people. Cars. The, the single thing that's missing, there are no trees, no plants, no grass, no nothing. We have two things in Antarctica. We have rock and we have ice, and that is it. 
So all you people with allergies, how many have allergies? Go to Antarctica, you won't have any allergies. Because there's nothing there, there's no mold, there's no pollen, there are no animals, so no fur, no feathers, nothing like that. And nothing but rock and ice. So people who have allergies get down there and they've never felt better. <laughs> so it's a little mining town, you live in a dorm, just like you might live here. Go here in the cafeteria for your food. Helicopters over here, wastewater treatment here. It's like a little town. These pipes are for, uh, we desalinate the ocean water. And the fresh water goes in, dirty water comes out, goes into here, and it goes back into the ocean. So it's like a little town. There's about 600 people that work there and about 200 scientists, people like me, so about 800 at any given time. Here's that active volcano. Who knew? It has a crater and a lava lake right in the bottom of it. Here you can see that lava coming up. They, there are some crystals that come out of this uh, lava lake called the Erebus crystals, only place in the world that they have them. And I, I wore mine, I have one here, that has been polished up and wrapped in silver, only place in the whole world that has these. They're not unique because of what they are, they're just feldspar. So that's a very common mineral, but they're unique in their size. So they cool in this lava lake and they get blown out. And I brought some to share with you. So first five people up here at the end of the... Um, actually, I should ask some questions if you want. And anybody who would like some crystals, I have them here for you to give away. You're welcome to take them with you. You will not find them anywhere else in the world. So an Erebus crystal is pretty special. All right, what am I doing? Okay, so here's some of the other research uh, things that go on. While I'm talking, I want you to be thinking in your head, would this be something I'd want my students to get involved in? Would this be a project that as it was going on, I could have my students connected to these scientists? I could tell this science story in my classroom. The other thing you might be thinking is, well, I'd kind of like to be the teacher on that team. And if that's what you're thinking, then I encourage you to do it. The scientists need people like you. They need people like you. We'll talk about that at the end of the talk. They need people like you to take their story and tell it to the world. So here's one of the really great stories. Somebody built this thing. This is a, they had to be able to get down through that ice and with a ROV that will take pictures and bring up water samples. Someone designed this. It's just a piece of PVC pipe with the cameras and motors in it. And it got down into the ocean, there it is, and it came up with these pictures. Extraordinary things under the ice that they had not seen before. It's a spider. These incredible creatures. So here's some of the science that's going on down there. Again, it's all about getting our kids engaged in what's going on now. Not what scientists did 200 years ago. All those guys are dead. These people are alive and doing this stuff now. So let's get our kids involved in it. People test the soil. There's really no soil in Antarctica, so this is slide is a little bit wrong. There's no soil. What would be making the soil? You got some rock and you got some ice. That's all you got. So there's really no soil, but there is some sand stuff, and here they are testing if there's any nutrients in it. Did they find any? Yeah, they did. So that's really exciting. Again, getting our kids involved in what's going on right now. Anybody into space stuff? We have a cosmic ray telescope down there. They get new stuff every single year. Connecting your kids to those science projects would be fantastic. They're drilling into the sediments underneath the ice cores, bringing up um, information that's telling us about what Antarctica was like 200,000 years ago, a million years ago. These are sediment cores from the bottom of the ocean. Very, very interesting stuff. And of course, people are down there um, Studying the whales, these are killer whales. This is a brand new baby right here, so it's like you get this shot. People are tagging these whales, and with the tags on the whales, then the whales go out and they, they send back information to where, the, where they are. And you can get on your computer, you can show your kids the movement of these whales as they go along. Assuming this guy right here can get his tag attached to the whale, then you actually can see it online and see where those whales go. A really great project for your kids. Turns out, who knew, underneath all though that ice was a, is a system of lakes in Antarctica. And these lakes are connected by streams. This particular area here is all under, below sea level. And the British were trying to drill into here. The Russians were trying to drill into here. The Americans were trying to drill in here. Oh no, it wasn't a race at all. No, of course it wasn't, but of course it was. And it turns out the uh, both of the, the Russians and the British uh, fell apart and they were not 
able to do it, the Americans were able to do it, and we got into, we went a kilometer through this ice into a lake underneath sub-sea level. Was it fresh water or was it salt water? We didn't know until we got there. What do you think it was? It was! Oh, you read the book! Okay. <laughs> oh, everybody knew. Okay, so we, I, we had bets going. We did not know. The scientists didn't know. We didn't know whether it was going to be fresh or salt. It turned out to be fresh. Here's what that drill looked like. Huge operation here. Here's the team that put it together. And there it is, the leader they brought up from 800 meters underneath the ice. In, and it was fresh water. And not only was it fresh water, they found living, respiring cells. Now these cells haven't seen oxygen, have been not been exposed to our atmosphere, have not seen daylight for probably 40, 50, 60,000 years, and yet these were respiring cells, and here they are plated out. So get your kids involved in this stuff. This is way more interesting than what's in the textbooks. And they, this team, by the way, this team needs a teacher to translate their story to the internet so that kids can have access to this information. It's called the wizard team, by the way. So here, you know, that's a, just a taste of some of the exciting stuff that goes on in, in Antarctica. And okay, so you're not interested in Antarctica. There's exciting stuff going on all over the world. Please, please get your kids involved in stuff that's going on. It's all out on the internet and it's all free for you to do. Okay, so here's where I live. I work with the Adelie penguins and these little guys. Another question I ask the kids, are the penguins' legs short or long? So what do the kids say? <laughs> they all say short, of course, because all the cartoons they see, all the pictures they see, every even the ones if you see them live in the zoos and stuff, their legs seem to be short and they waddle along. Well, it isn't that their legs are so short is that their body is so long. So our body ends here. Well, their body ends way down here. So think about wrapping a sack around yourself and then walking, you would wobble too. So here's a skeleton of these birds, and this is, shows their very powerful legs. So this is the kind of story that I tell kids. This is the kind of thing they see when they get on the website. Way more interesting than what's in the textbook. A lot of uh, adaptation, you can see here these birds feathers all the way down to the end of their beaks, feathers around their eyes, uh, adaptations with their mouths. This is part of the outreach that I do, is telling kids about adaptations, giving them the pictures, letting them do the research themselves. Here they can count the, uh, just take a chicken, the activity here is uh, go get a piece of chicken with a uh, skin on it and count the dots in a square, um, a square inch and then count the dots here and you'll compare the number of feathers on a chicken as opposed to a penguin. Of course, the penguins are the most densely covered uh, birds in the world, about 100 uh, feathers per square inch. Uh, except for their brood patch here, so here's uh, part of their bellies. Uh, it's not covered with feathers because it, it just fits where the eggs are. And remember, the feathers aren't warm, it's the body that's warm, so the, the eggs are kept there. Of course, the, these guys build nests out of rocks. Here's a beautiful Adelie nest. This male here has spent some time building it, and he's going to protect it. He can't leave this nest. He has to stand there, otherwise other birds will come and take those rocks away. So once he comes ashore, and once he builds this nest, he has to stand there, and then he has to display to the female and get her to come. And we have the uh, Feng Shui uh, picture here. Not all nests are the same. Birds do have uh, priorities and, and senses about things, and all of these nests were within probably you know, 200 yards of each other, so it's not that there weren't any other rocks, but some birds pick big ones, some little, some make huge piles, and some don't make piles at all. So their penguins are a little bit different, just like us. So here we are, this is a male doing his display. He's hoping a female will come by and think that's just the best nest he's ever seen, and, or she's ever seen, and will mate with him. They don't all stop. They don't all stay. And these poor males will just go like this, and then another female will come along and he'll do his dance again. And sometimes he'll bow, you guys. Bowing works. Sometimes the penguins will bow to the females. That helps out. Eventually, a female will come, decide this is a pretty good pile of rocks for her, and she'll mate with this guy. And there we have a mated pair for the season. No, they do not mate for life. And our studies have shown that, and the only way we know that is because we have them, and we can identify them. So we debunked that myth pretty fast, though they do make
for this season, though. Here's a bunch of uh, males sitting on their nest. Another question I asked the kids, I want to take our time now to do that, but the spacing between these birds, it's about a meter, center to center. So when I do the work with the kids and one of the activities on the website, is I show them this picture, I say, hey, why are those birds spaced meter to meter? Why aren't they closer? Why aren't they further apart? So I have several of those kinds of problems for kids to solve on the website. More interesting than those problems, you know, a train left Chicago and one in Los Angeles going, whatever. This is more interesting and fun to have them solve these kinds of problems. They carry the um, egg on their feet and they, do you have a question? They're wired in the apart. Oh, you tell me. Oh, we think, oh, who wants no, rocks? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> it's not so much why they're meter. Why aren't they closer or why aren't they farther apart? Yeah. Um, that's, that's part of it. That's okay. part of it so that they can walk through. Um, give me more. Give me more. You get a little walk. <laughs> <laughs> you get a little walk. Pass the, pass the spec. You get a little walk. That, that's part of it so that they can get through. Everybody have another idea? Not enough rocks around. That's a good thing, but there's plenty of rocks. So it's the spacing of the nest. So why, why are they, why aren't they closer to the bed? Why aren't they further apart? Yes, that's a big she gets a big mark. So these birds are extremely territorial, and if they were closer together to the point where they could touch each other, they would peck at each other. So you'll also notice that none of them are looking at each other, because if they could, if they look at each other, and they can reach each other, they'll peck each other. So they're almost exactly spaced so they can't quite reach each other. Why aren't they further apart? Oh, oh, somebody else. Oh, oh, yeah. Is there, is there well, somebody that's being exchanged between them? That's, that's keeping them a little bit closer together? That, that's an excellent idea. The answer is no, but that's an excellent idea. Yeah. It's like for protection. Uh, I was going to show a few more slides and you would have gotten it, but there's a predatory bird, and if they're further apart, then the predatory bird can get between them and get the eggs. And if they're, they're close enough so if the predatory bird lands in between them, they can reach them and peck them. So it's just the right amount of space to keep them from pecking each other, but allow them to defend their nests against the, against the skuas. Anyway, so here we go. Good job. I got two more, so we'll ask some more questions later. Here we go. The chicks, they're so great. They, they come out of their eggs. The parents hold them. They won't help them. They're just as cute as they can possibly be. There's two eggs in every nest. They usually hatch a couple days apart. They grow very fast. Uh, here you see it's very engaging. Uh, I take pictures every day. The kids adopt a nest. And then I take pictures of that nest every single day to send to those kids. So they're coming into the internet and watching their chicks grow. Of course, they name them, and I just pray they don't die, because I hate it when Fluffy dies. But <laughs> sometimes Fluffy dies. And I do not sugarcoat it. Here you see them standing on their parents' feet to stay warm. Oh, wait, I should have asked that question. Um, there were a lot, but you guys would have gotten it. Anyway, they grow very fast. You see their bellies are huge. How cold is it when, they, when the chicks hatch? It's always below freezing. You don't see any snow here because it's so windy. It's always below freezing. I'm wearing 25 pounds of clothes when I'm out there. And these chicks are being guarded, so the parents are always around them. Otherwise, they would freeze. So they have to be taken care of. And they do grow extremely fast. They're just as engaging as you possibly can imagine. See the gut on that guy? They eat 60 pounds of food to raise a chick. Here's one that's just about as big as this can get. And it's going to start to molt next. And this is a feeding uh, procedure. And you can see the molting has started here. They're starting to lose the chick feathers. Part of my job is to sit around and check what they're feeding. Pink, krill, silver fish. So I'm sitting there freezing my tush off, marking down what the things are eating. And that's part of what I do. 
Um, and here's a molter just to, just getting in a state of adult bubble uh, nature. They, they can't be on their own. They can't go in the water until they get their adult plumage. This stuff, you can see how thick it is, keeps them warm, but it doesn't keep them dry. So they have to wait to get to this stuff, stage before they can get their own food. Here's one almost ready to go. It takes a lot to raise a chick, 60 pounds of food per chick. There are many, many hazards. Part of it is storms. With climate change, we're starting to see a few more storms. This is the summertime, remember. It never rains, only snows. And you see these birds will not abandon their chicks, back always to the wind, keeping their chicks warm and dry underneath here. This is a chick that couldn't be guarded. Big storm comes in, they just allow themselves to be covered. These are chicks. They just allow themselves to be covered. As long as that snow doesn't melt, they can stay warm. If it melts, then and they get wet, they're in trouble. At the end of the storm, they just shake that off, and off they go. So these storms are OK. They're used to that, and they're built for it. They're better built than I am. But with climate change, we're starting to see storms like this, with more snow than they can handle. This is about a foot and a half here. This bird is standing up on top of her chick, and she can't get out. And this bird is also, they put their flippers up like this to get a, an air hole. She's standing up. She cannot get out. So this is very bad, and we're starting to see this more and more. It's very, very sad. Now, these birds, they're OK, but they didn't have a nest. So this bird didn't allow itself to be buried because it's stupid. It allowed itself to be buried because it's on a chick, and it won't leave its chick. So these guys didn't care. They're out there, but this one is on a chick. Did I take a shovel and dig it out? You betcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the rules are, you see the rules. <laughs> the rules for me is I'm down there as an observer only. I am not to interfere with anything. I cannot uh, change nature. But if you think I'm going to sit there and watch this happen, this is no way. I took a shovel and got as far as where I'm kind of taking the picture, and then I used my hands because I didn't want to affect the chick. But there were about 20 birds like this, and yeah, we dug them out. How could we not? So now here's that skua. See, now you would get the skua thing. There, it's a big shearwater bird. They tag team the birds. So here's a bird. Uh-oh, where's the other nest? It's not there. So this uh, bird built a nest more than a meter away from its closest neighbor. And first one egg, and then the other got picked off really fast. So that's why they have to be close in. But here you see they play helicopter, and then they just drop right in and take the egg out. So I'm looking at you. Here's what a successful hunt looks like. And this is why. Because they have their own chicks. So this is very hard for me. Again, I'm an observer only. I'm not allowed to interfere. Can I shoo the school away? And I, and I don't. The schools have deserved to live as well. So they've got their chicks. Some anomalies for penguins. The kids love this stuff. Penguins don't look all alike, so just like us. We look different, and so do the penguins. So some misplaced white feathers here. <laughs> some yellow. We get albinos. When it gets a little bit older, they turn white. Never seen an al adult albino. We see albino chicks, but never seen an adult one. This one we thought was a different species. I mean, we really did. When we, we went up to it, we said, what the heck is that? Well, it's just an interesting bird, brown, and all black. So this is an all black one, although it has a chick that was uh, colored uh, normally. So we don't know where that goes. And this was uh, the only time we ever saw this, a hairless chick. So we call this our naked chick picture. Anyway, so it's, um, <laughs> we were, I wanted to, I wanted to knit a sweater, and <laughs> the, 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 our, our PI, our scientist, said no. It's going to die. Yeah, it's going to die. And that's what it is. But anyway, so we do get some anomalies. I'm just going to run through some of these pictures. Penguins do fly. Sometimes they have to jump between the, the flows. They're very curious. They'll come right up to you. Extraordinary scenery in Antarctica. Lots and lots of ways to engage children in the stories about Antarctica and about penguins. They love penguins. They love Antarctica. It's a great way to get them involved in science. We don't just have penguins. We've got seals. These are Adels. They're also very engaging, and they're not afraid of you. You can walk right up to them. They have no land predators, no polar bear. So they don't care. They just look at you, they'll come over to you, and of course those whales. Lots and lots of things to engage kids. 
some of the work that we do. We have to catch them sometimes. We do hold on to them. We weigh and measure them. The kids are go nuts. We, they say, these are the tools that you use? Yeah, a canvas bag and a spring scale. So they think that scientists always use all this really fancy equipment. Some scientists do, but not all of them. You could do this. Kids, you can do this. So there are no more different tools than what you have in your classroom. We are catching here, um, throw out the adults, weigh the chicks, and put these bands on them. So here we are banding them. It's about as big as your finger. It goes right around there. I think here has a number on it. And that's how we can then follow their lives. So that's how come we know they don't make for permit. We see these guys swap a nest here to here. Uh, measure them, give them a little pat, and off they go. So here's a hard day at the office for me and the scientists. Here's where I live. So some of you are thinking, oh, I'd really like to be the teacher down on that thing. And yes, you would, and, and I'm going to retire here in a couple years, so we need someone to take my place. But this is where we live. It's not very, um, well, it's not in the five-star category, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I don't have running water. I can't take a shower. I can't wash my hair for the two and a half months that I'm out there or change my clothes. I sleep in this tent, and there's no heat, and I pee in a bucket in here. But I have wireless internet, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I can connect all of this and everything I do every day to kids around the world, and that's my job as an educator. So even though I'm a field slave down there, my real job, or my, my big job, my push is to educate field. Yeah, to educate kids about this stuff. So this is our only source of electricity here. So how many would think this would be fun? When I talk to kids, I get every hand in the air, which means kids are engaged in science and want to do it, and we have to keep that interest up. But then, you know, it doesn't look very fun in the inside here. you got your stove, a little bit of heater, green water, crackers and cheese, that's about it. But I wouldn't trade it for anything. Here's the toilet. Everybody wants to ask about that. So, pee goes in here. No, we leave zero footprint. No, nothing goes thrown away. Pee goes in here, so all it gets in here until it fills up, and then we get another bucket. But not very pretty. And we get storms too. And so this is after a three day storm. Our entire tent was covered and we had to shovel ourselves out. It wasn't very much fun, but that's how it goes. And this is how we get around. So our helicopters come and take us if we need to go someplace. So that's my life there. Now, now we're going to go into the meat of this. I, just my little tour about Antarctica and what I do. But this is, this is the important part. This is engaging our kids, our classroom kids, getting them interested in science. I know you've heard the statistics about how um, we need scientists, we need more scientists. And if you're going to be a science teacher, it's your job to get kids interested in science so that when they get to college and they take a career, they will choose one of those STEM careers. Everybody knows about STEM, right? So we need more people doing this. Well, the job that you will have as science teachers, well, I don't care what you're teaching, you're going to have the same job. It's taking complex topics and breaking it down so that kids can understand it. And not only understand it, be engaged with it. That's the most important part. It, they have to be engaged with it. We use the term, I use the term, accessible. It has to be accessible to them. Accessible meaning, can they understand it? They read it. Is it engaging? And that's the, what I say is accessible. So without engagement, remember, there's not going to be any learning. You do not engage your students. So three parts to this. First, we have to get it out there. We have to get it to you so you can use it. and you Or you have to get it from us or from the scientists. You have to make it understandable, and then you have to engage them in it. So three parts to getting the science from here down to here so that the kids can learn it. So this method here is try, you know, books on a shelf. Doesn't seem to work too much because kids, are kids reading as much as they used to? Are you guys reading as much as they used to? You know, people don't read books so much anymore. So putting all this information in these books doesn't seem to work. It seems to work better if you put it into this kind of form. More pictures, easier text, something to engage the kids. This is what people are doing. And they have to be able to understand. So um, you guys are all in education. I, I didn't, I wasn't real sure what my audience was going to be. So this part's going to be very, uh, uh, you guys know about this. You know about readability, right? And text and readability and levels of readability. So um, what you're going to run into sometimes in taking science or history or whatever you're going to teach, math, 
taking it and getting it down to the student's level is that readability thing. So here it is, but we're not reading this. This is just an original science article out of a journal. Here's the reference if you're interested. Anyway, this is the original paper running it through that readability test. Difficult to read, hard to read, 12th grade. People aren't going to read this stuff. That's that same text rewritten in Science Daily. Again, hard to read, difficult to read, 12th grade. Again, written in the New York Times, exact same article. New York Times editors took that journal article and wrote, wrote it through here. Standard average, hard to read, 10th grade, you guys are familiar with these scales. Still, hard for most of our kids to accept it. Because I couldn't resist, I, I wrote it because this is what I do. I wrote that same article, and now it's fairly easy to read, easy to read, and at the seventh grade level. So as science educators, math educators, history educators, you may have